At Germantown Presbyterian Church, welcome one and all indeed, and a special word of welcome to everybody who is worshiping with us online this morning. We're delighted that you are worshiping with us at home or wherever you may be. So a warm welcome uh, to Germantown Presbyterian Church and a warm welcome from Germantown Presbyterian Church to all of you who are worshiping with us today. I do remind you that you can download the bulletin for today's service if you're worshiping with us at home. You can go to the resources tab that's at the top of our church website and you can scroll down and find the tab that says bulletins and then you'll find this morning's bulletin right there. You can also go to the sermons.net page where you may be watching this and you can go to the download PDF tab and there you'll find the bulletin for this morning's service. And so again, uh, thank you for worshiping with us here. Thank you for worshiping with us online. And it is great on this Easter morning, again, to see some folks who are with us who haven't been with us in over a year, to be back here, to be worshiping with us on this site, to be here is very special for all of us and very special, I know, for several folks who haven't been here in quite some time. So happy Easter, and he is risen, he is risen indeed. Um, It is very special to welcome everybody into this service, and if you're watching online, live streaming, and you say to yourself, Sanctuary looks a little different from usual. Well, that's because we're in our new temporary sanctuary due to the great flood of 2021 that happened when we had a burst pipe back in February. And so, yes, this activities center is our new sanctuary for just a few more months until July. But we look forward to everybody uh, worshiping again with us in person back in the, uh, the true sanctuary as soon as possible. And that will happen, we know, as they continue our reconstructive efforts. Uh, As part of our announcements this morning, I do want to call your attention to several announcements that are there in your bulletin. One is a reminder to come back this evening at 6 o'clock for our contemporary worship service. We'll have our worship service in here, and that'll be uh, in person at 6. You can join us online for the live stream of that service as well. And then in the upcoming weeks, you'll see an announcement for the youth auction and that's next Sunday, and that's Youth Sunday also next Sunday. So you want to watch that, you want to be here for that, and then sign up for your slot for the Youth Auction. You can buy your tickets and your time to come and peruse the amazing, amazing um, auction items that we have uh, to raise funds for our youth trips, including airplane tickets for your own private trip down to the beach down uh, to have dinner on someone's boat down on the Gulf Coast. And so uh, amazing event uh, things you'll want to auction on. Please do sign up for your tickets for the youth auction. See the announcement in here about our Memphis Joy Prom, our prom for persons with special needs, and that's always a very special time for our whole church to support that effort. And so you'll want to um, to please uh, sign up for that and to take part and to help out in the Joy Prom, which is more like a parade this year. Don't forget also about Nakomi sign-up and the registration for that. You might be able to slip just under the wire for that really fun occasion and sign up for that as well. All of these different things that are going on in the life of the church, we want you to know about, to participate in, and to be as excited about them as, as all of us are. We're grateful for all of our guests who are here to help us worship This morning, thank you for your presence here. It's always wonderful to have our musicians and our guest musicians who are part of this service. And a reminder that today is Communion Sunday, and so if you're worshiping with us in here in person and you didn't receive communion elements, they're in the baskets over by the door, and you can uh, just slip over there and pick those up. And if you're worshiping with us uh, at home, then you can have elements of bread and uh, juice or wine, and you can participate also in the sacrament with us at home. And if you don't have those elements, then that's just fine also. You'll be blessed by the liturgy and blessed by the words of institution as part of our worship today. So again, friends, happy Easter. Welcome to Germantown Presbyterian Church. And now let us worship God.
Please rise in body or spirit and join in our call to worship. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise God's holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. God redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. God satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Let us worship God.
Jesus' rising from the dead assures us that we too have been given new life. Let us repent of our sin before God and one another, certain of God's mercy. Let us pray. Lord, you are our strength and our shield. You have become our salvation. We praise you, our living God. We were once dead in sin, yet now we have been raised with Christ. We confess that we are imperfect in our faith. We acknowledge that we are hindered by doubt and fear, unsure where to look for you, and still tempted to sin. This day we rejoice in the pardon you provide and in the hope you give to us. Speak to us a word that reveals your presence. Open to us the gates of righteousness that we may enter through them, giving thanks and praise to you, our living Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As our children come forward, I invite you to wave and share the grace of Christ with those around you. Remember everyone in our church family, take time to check on your friends in Christ, extend your love to them, and pray for them today and in the coming week. Well, good morning, boys and girls, and happy Easter. I'm glad to see you here today. Have you had a good morning so far? Have you seen some things that help to remind you about Easter? What are some things that remind you about Easter? Easter bunny. The Easter bunny came this morning. Did he leave you something, a basket? Just um, a big thing of bubbles and a bubble sword. Oh, that sounds so fun. It's going to be the perfect day to go outside and use that. Yay. Well, I have some um, things that also we use at Easter. You see at Easter some that help you just kind of think about Easter. And yes, they're Easter eggs. I have this one right here. It's white and it's full. It's a real egg. That's why it's in the basket. And then I also have an Easter egg right here. So let me ask you, um, When you think about the baby chick and a a mom hen sitting on the egg and the baby chick, what happens on the Easter egg, on the egg, when the chick is ready to come out? It hatches. Yeah, it hatches and then out comes a little chick life, right? Well, I was going to talk today about the Easter egg and how that can help remind us about Easter. We think about Easter eggs. We think it's a good visual to help you remember about life coming out, like the little chick coming out. But at Easter, we think about Jesus coming out 
of the tomb. And so I can crack my Easter egg open. And this is the real Easter egg. So it looks like this. And that is the real Easter egg, and it's empty, just like when the disciples went to the tomb, and they opened the tomb, the tomb was empty, because Jesus had risen, and he um, brings us new life in him, and that's what we celebrate today on Easter, that Jesus rose from the dead, and we can have new life in him. And it's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. So will you all, I'm going to say a prayer. Will y'all help pray with me? Can you say what I say in the prayer? Okay, let's do it together. Okay. Dear Lord, today we celebrate the empty grave. We thank you that Jesus is not in the grave. He is risen. And because of that, We can have new life in him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Happy Easter. Let us pray. Lord God, we approach your word this morning with certain expectations, expectations of what it might say on this Easter morning. And so we pray, Lord, that you would surprise us just as you surprised those disciples and Mary with an empty tomb. We pray that you would surprise us now, O God, with a special word inspired by your Holy Spirit in what we read and what we hear at this time. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This morning we read from John's account of the resurrection. It comes in John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. John chapter 21, 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And so she ran and she told the other disciples, Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, she ran and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and they went to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and he reached the tomb first. He bent down and he looked in and he saw that the linen wrappings were lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, followed him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all these things that he had said to her. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. For our Easter morning reflection today, I want us to put ourselves back into Mary Magdalene's place. Imagine that we are her. Imagine that we are her on this early, dark morning. And I think that we can all do that because we have all been where she is. And if we haven't, then just wait because we will. We have all been in that place of deep grief, of sincere sadness, of great heartache. Mary has come to grieve at this place where she still has a kind of connection with Jesus there at the tomb. She saw them lay his body in the tomb. She saw them roll that stone over the mouth of that tomb. This morning, to stay connected in some way or another. And she is coming in deep grief. It's like going to the cemetery on the annual anniversary of a loved one's death. Have you ever done that? Maybe taken flowers? Or just gone to to stand there and be there. I do that um, usually around August. My dad's graveside. And to see his name on the stone and just stand there for a little while. And try to feel some kind of connection through memory. Even though there is that stone and there is not himself there in the ground. But that's that connecting place of memory and of grief. I pass by our memorial garden here at church very often and I will very frequently see flowers down on the ground at the feet of that wall there and I'll go over and look and sure enough, it will be the birthday or the death date of of some beloved church member or family member who's there in that wall. We all do that. We have that need for connection even in the midst of grief. Graves and memorial gardens and tombs are a physical place that remains a connecting place of memory and love and and all grief. You and whatever remains of that person whom you loved. She could go, is there? And there's nowhere else that she can go at that moment in her life, at that moment in time. Where else could she go but but to the tomb on that early morning to feel a connection with this man who had just rescued her from so much. I mean, Jesus had saved her. We read about these accounts in Scripture, and Mary Magdalene is counted among that group of women that many infirmities. Luke tells us that Jesus healed Mary of seven demons, and, and we don't have any idea of what those were, but we know that they just ruined her life. They wrecked her life. But not anymore. Not anymore since she met Jesus. Now she is whole. Jesus made her whole. He gave her her life back. He gave her her identity back. And she became a follower. And and he became her teacher. And he became her friend. Her very dear friend. And now that was lost. Now that was lost. All of that was lost. Think about what she had lost. She had found her identity in Jesus. She had found her identity by becoming one of these followers, by becoming one who supported Jesus in his ministry, by being around him and those disciples. She had found her true self, her true calling in and around Jesus and those disciples, and all of that was gone. All of that was lost. So now all she can do is weep. And and one of the first truths I want us to see out of this Easter morning reading is this idea of weeping and how overwhelming grief is in our lives. Weeping is the right word for what she experiences. It's not crying. It's not crying because we all cry a lot sometimes. We cry, babies cry and pout when they're hungry. They don't get their way when they're scared. And that's pretty much all of us. I cry when I'm hungry and scared and don't get my way and pout. We all do that. We cry at movies, we cry at touching stories. Sometimes we laugh until we cry. Tears flow from us for different moods and different reasons that we experience. But weeping is... Uh, 
this passage four times, four times, four times to underscore all that she is experiencing and all that she is going through. Mary wept outside the tomb. Mary wept when she looked into the tomb. Mary weeps so much that she can't even recognize who is talking to her. She is weeping in that can't catch your breath, red face, tear stained face, red face, wet face, can't think, head aching, inducing heart aching type of weeping. Have you ever been there? Have you ever wept like that? You probably have, and if you haven't, then just wait, because you will, because you cannot live in this life of ours, you cannot live this human life without experiencing deep, deep grief at some point, and then probably at many points along the way. Grief is this human condition. It's a human condition, it's a human emotion that we sort of understand the least, and and the truth. The other emotions sort of hit you, that they're always sort of spontaneous. Other emotions are usually based on external conditions and things that you react to based on what other people do. Maybe your humor and your laughter or even your anger. It's all a reaction to some external condition. Maybe being embarrassed or maybe being annoyed. These around you. An April Fool's joke, for example, might make you laugh, it might make you angry, it might annoy you, especially if you're on the receiving end of it from all of your church colleagues as they gang up on you right before the Monday, Thursday. Motion of revenge after that. Most emotions are temporary, and then you move on, but not with grief. Grief is so much longer lasting, it is so much deeper, and the truth is, it is uncontrollable. You can learn how to control your temper, but not your grief. Maybe even your laughter, but not your grief. It's one of the main reasons we started about seven years ago a grief ministry group here at Germantown Presbyterian Church, because grief is so serious it affects our souls. I talked this week to Stephanie Wall, who's one of the leaders of our grief ministry group. And she reminded me as a trained grief counselor, she reminded me of just how profoundly and deeply grief affects us mentally, physically, spiritually. We have this physical pain in our bodies when our hearts and our minds and our souls hurt. It affects us physically. It affects us spiritually. We have all kinds of anguish about God and God's love and God's purpose for us when we are experiencing deep and profound grief. Your brain doesn't work like it should when you're undergoing grief. When I was about eight years old, I got a concussion at the end of my brother's knee when it hit me in the eye socket as we were wrestling and tumbling and running in our upstairs hallway. And I can remember in the hours after that, I can remember people talking to me and and sort of asking me questions and making sure I was all right, but I didn't know how to respond, and I could hear what they were saying, but fo- couldn't formulate a response. It was just totally dazed and confused. Well, grief is like a long-term concussion to the heart. You can't think straight. People all around you are going about your normal routines. They're talking and going about their work and everything as if nothing is wrong. While for you, everything is wrong. So many things go wrong in other parts of your life when you're experiencing grief. They just compound over and over again with grief. About 10 years ago, a movie came out called The Rabbit Hole, starring Nicole Kidman. It's a story of what happens to Kidman and her husband after their four-year-old child uh, is struck by a car and killed. There are several scenes where Kidman's character, Becca, she just exists in a fog within her own home. And she can't She can't go about, she can't do any of her regular routines and any of the chores. How do you make coffee? How do you do laundry? She just slips into this void where everything is confusing. Everything is a chore. In one scene, she just weeps uncontrollably in her car at a stoplight, and she just can't stop. All of her relationships, including her marriage, fall apart due to the grief that she is experiencing. 
And that's the experience for all of us when we undergo profound grief, when our hearts absorb that concussive blow, then grief just overwhelms us. There was no worse blow that Mary Magdalene could experience than the death of Jesus on the cross. It was this terribly, terribly devastating blow. This innocent man, I mean, this great teacher, this great friend, this one who had saved her and rescued her, this person who brought everybody closer to God than they ever could imagine, this one who they believed was the Son of God, was arrested and tortured and he was crucified and then laid in a tomb. Her grief is so immense and she is weeping. That, that grief, the reality of grief for her, the reality of grief for all of us, this all-pervasive, deeply affecting reality of grief is the first truth that we have to encounter on this Easter morning. That grief is so real and so deep for all of us and that it is uncontrollable and exists like a wave in all of our lives and sometimes it's at low tide, but sometimes it rises up and it affects you and hits you and you just can't even imagine what it's like. And you roll under that wave like Mary Magdalene did on that Easter morning. But then the second truth from this reading, it it comes in the form of a question. And it's a question that's asked of Mary Magdalene. and, And I think actually it's a question that hangs over all of our lives all of the time. This question cracks open the truth that all of us are looking for something. All of us are searching. That to be a human being is to be this wayfarer, this pilgrim in search of something meaningful on which you can base your life. In the middle of her weeping, two questions are posed to Mary, actually by Jesus himself. They're posed by the angels, but by Jesus himself. She doesn't even know that it's Jesus. And she gets these two questions. Woman, why are you weeping? And we know that because of the profound nature of of grief. But then the second question comes to her that changes her. Who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Now, it's something very important about this question that comes right here. The first words that we hear come out of the mouth of the resurrected Jesus because... These are the very same questions that Jesus asks at the very beginning of the Gospel of John. Go all the way back to chapter 1. In fact, in the Gospel of John, the first questions that Jesus ever says in the whole Gospel are, what are you looking for? And it's a play on words here in the Greek because the same interrogative word Greek here for what or who is interchangeable. So the same question that Jesus asks at the very end is asked at the very beginning What are you looking for? Who are you searching for? What are you looking for? What are you seeking? It comes at the very beginning. Jesus is is walking up the road to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, here is the Lamb of God. Two of John's own disciples then go up to Jesus and they begin to ask him questions. They begin to ask him questions about his identity and what is he doing and where is he staying? And Jesus says, what are you looking for? And ask him more questions. And all he says is, come and see. Just just come and see. And they start to follow him. And then the whole rest of this gospel of John is this account of people who encounter Jesus. And he is saying, just come and see. Just come and get to know me. Come and listen to my ways and, and hear what I have to say and see what I do. Just come and see what you are looking for. And the whole gospel is the answer to this question that hangs over all of our lives. What are you searching for? Who are you searching for? Everyone is looking for something. Everybody is looking for someone to give their life ultimate meaning. Some person, some cause, some reason for living. Everyone is searching. What are you looking for? Why did you come to Easter services this morning? Why are you watching? Why are you worshiping on this day? Who are you searching for? The two main characters in Walker Percy's novel, The Second Coming, are both searching characters. Will Barrett was a very successful attorney in New York, but his marriage was one of convenience and not really one of love. He inherits a huge windfall 
from his wife when she dies. And he moves back to his boyhood home in the mountains of western North Carolina that's based on the town of Highlands, North Carolina. And he goes back to live on this luxurious golf course. The book opens with Will Barrett falling down in a sand trap and he can't get up. And that fall and his inability to rise up becomes symbolic in the rest of the whole book and all for all these other places where he searches for meaning and some crutch to help him up. And he can't find it. He's an intellectual and he goes through all of these arguments for and against the existence of God. He's a very talented individual. He's talented at playing golf and he's talented at drinking. He's talented at making money. He's talented at charming other people, especially women. He's talented at owning several luxury cars, and yet, and yet, and yet, he keeps falling down, and he can't get up from all of these traps of life. We come to find out that his own heart was concussed 40 years before this by his dad's suicide, and that grief has been awakened by recent events. The other main character is Allison, and she has amnesia, and she is lost. She can't remember who she is, and she lives in this dilapidated old greenhouse in a fog. She writes notes to herself to try to remind herself who she is and and what she's supposed to do and where she's supposed to go. She is recovering from trauma, and she doesn't even know her own identity in her life. Aren't they symbolic of all of us? Aren't we both of them? Aren't we both of those characters in our own real life drama? We're so geared toward all of the trappings of success that we can't realize when we're trapped by them and we fall down into them and we can't get out. All of us in our lives, we we forget our true identity in the God who made us. We forget our true identity in God and we can't think of who we are and we go about searching and stumbling through all of our lives. Jesus is constantly asking us, who are you looking for? What will satisfy you finally? What is your heart's desire? What do you believe in that will finally bring you peace? That's this other great truth that comes out of this reading, this truth that God is asking each one of us on this Easter morning. The same question that God is asking us through Christ throughout all of our lives. Maybe we don't even know it's God asking us. It's part of our conscience, part of our mind. But God is asking us this question constantly, but especially on this particular Easter morning. Who are you looking for? What can you find that will finally satisfy you? Is it not me? Says Jesus. Is it not me? And then the third great truth of this Easter scripture, this great Easter morning truth is this. That when you hear Jesus' voice, all other things fall away and everything else becomes clearer. Your own purpose, your own work, your own family, your whole life becomes clearer when you hear Jesus call your name in faith. Even when, and especially when you are grieving and when you are in the pits of life and when you are in that despairing place, when you are so hurt, when you are searching and trying to figure out who you are, listen for Christ's voice because he calls your name. He calls out each and every person's name because the God who made you knows you better than you even know yourself and he is calling out your name, hoping you will respond in faith and just listen and become clear in who you are. Mary can't see or hear think, or hear straight. She can't think straight. She is in this place of deep grief. But what happens? What happens when Jesus calls out her name? Her tears stop. She knows that she he knows her identity. She immediately recognizes him. His voice has a way of clearing out all of the fog and all of her disorientation. Mary. That's all he says. Mary. She says, Rabboni, teacher. She hears his voice. Her vision is immediately clear. Her weeping then turns into tears of joy. 
Hearing Jesus call her name is this life-changing, life-claiming truth on her. She becomes a follower and a friend all over again. And this time, post-resurrection, this time it is forever and ever and ever. Beyond death. Teacher, friend, follower, master. Jesus and Mary. You and Jesus and God forever. Because of the truth of the resurrection. I'll finish by telling you this. In our church, over the years, we have read and we have studied books by the Presbyterian minister and writer named Tim Keller. If you've never read his books, if you've never read his book, Generous Justice, then it's got to be a must on your reading list. And so should a recent essay that he wrote in the Atlantic magazine. It's very poignant because a few months ago, Keller was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he has gone back and he has re-examined every one of his beliefs, every one of the things that he just assumed and that he taught that he preached about now suddenly has some dire urgency for him. And he's gone back and he has re-examined all of those beliefs, especially what he knows and believes about the resurrection. He has heard God's voice in the last several months, asking him again at the most basic level, what are you searching for? Who are you searching for? What do you believe in that can satisfy your soul? What is your hope based on? For Keller and for all of us, I imagine dying has had a way of bringing urgency to the deep questions of his life like no other time in his life. And he writes this. Most particularly for me as a Christian, what has come to the fore is Jesus's costly love his death and his resurrection, they have become something not just that I believe in and then file away, but they have become a hope for me that sustains me every day. Dear friends, this is the final truth of the resurrection, that it is a hope that will sustain you and me every day of our lives. And we rejoice on this Easter Sunday because the resurrected Jesus, he is the one that we are looking for of all of life's searches, of everything that we go through, all the agonizing griefs, everything we do in this life and experience, Jesus is ultimately and finally the one who will give us answers. He is the one who will bring us peace. Jesus is the one who will sustain us throughout every day of our lives. And then he will sustain us every day, even through our deaths. That's the hope of the resurrection. Amen, and happy Easter. We have been so blessed to hear God's word this morning on this Easter morning read and proclaimed to us. Let us now give back to God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings with great joy and generosity. If you're worshiping here with us in this worship space, you will find the offering trays right here by the door. You can't miss them on your way out. And if you're worshiping with us online, we invite you to go to the giving tab. And there on our website, you will find many ways to contribute to the work of this church that's called into being by Christ our Lord. Let us give with great hope and generosity and joy. Thank you. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet,
trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised and the dead shall be raised incorruptible the trumpet shall sound shall be raised, be raised incorruptible, be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, and we shall be To the presence of God with me and join with me in prayer. Long before we thought about being here, you knew us, Jesus. You loved us. You suffered and died. And you rose again from the dead so that we would rise out of sin and living for ourselves and find our home in you, in you alone. So remembering all of your mighty and merciful acts, we welcome your spirit to come. 
pour out on these ordinary elements of bread and juice. That in receiving these, we will have truly been nourished in the deepest parts of who we are by the real presence of your body and your blood, broken and shed, dying on the ultimate hill so that we don't have to. And in so doing, uniting us with all of your children, with all of your creation, empowering us to be your agents of grace, that we may celebrate every day the gift of embodying your love for all of the world. We lift you these words with those that you taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by his best friends, he sat down and he had dinner with them. And during the course of the meal, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat this. This bread is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. My friends, every time that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord and Savior's saving death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us partake in Holy Communion together. Body and blood of Christ. And let us turn to God in prayer. Holy God, in gratitude, in deep gratitude for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and we cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable many through us. Make us strong in our Lord's service so that we may follow him faithfully wherever he leads. Through Jesus Christ, we pray together saying, Amen.
My dear Christian friends, on this Easter Sunday, keep alert, stand firm, be courageous and strong, and let everything you do be done in love. Indeed, go out into the world, worshiping the risen Lord. Go out to love and serve God. Go out to love and serve your neighbor as yourself. And as you go, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and dwell in your heart and in your mind forever. Amen.